Hi everybody, no matter what kind of mood I'm in, that lead in video to science and stuff always puts me in a good one. Shout out to Trenton Oliver for making it. Thank you, thank you. Ding, ding, ding. That is right, that is right. Welcome to Science and Stuff, the show we, where we talk about science and stuff. I'm gonna say that again. Welcome to Science and Stuff, the show where we talk about science and stuff. I'm Anna Wenger, the showrunner of Mission Unstoppable, everyone's favorite TV show about the amazing leaders in science, technology, engineering, and math. Today, oh, sorry. I, I, uh, you can move the, we can move the slides a little bit faster, a little bit faster. Uh, you can catch Mission Unstoppable Saturday mornings on CBS, and the new season of Mission Unstoppable premieres this Saturday. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not that fast. <laughs> uh, premieres Saturday, January 2nd. This is our 10th episode of Science and Stuff. Thank you so much to everybody who's been tuning in week after week for all the science and all the stuff. Today, we have such an awesome show for you. First, we have structural engineer of airplanes and satellites, Sydney Hamilton. And after Sydney, we have aquarium biologist, Amanda Hodo. Uh, Amanda actually trains sharks. So we have an engineer who works on satellites and giant airplanes, and we have a uh, aquarium biologist who trains sharks. Couldn't be a bigger show. Uh, and Amanda has something special for us after her interview, so you definitely want to stick around for that. If you want to ask our guests questions, you can write them in our chat. And remember to subscribe to our Twitch channel so you don't miss an episode. And now it's time for... That's right, it's everyone's favorite segment, science newsy news that will impress your friends that you can't stop thinking about even if you wanted to. Our first news story is about two old friends who haven't seen each other in 20 years. They've spent millions, sometimes billions of miles apart from each other, but this month they will be meeting up, however briefly. That's right. Uh, the friends I'm talking about are actually planets, and the planets are Jupiter and Saturn, and they are currently on the path to con to to conjunction. Uh, they are currently on the path to conjunction. Conjunction means two or more objects meeting at a point in space or time. So imagine this. Jupiter and Saturn are both orbiting the sun, but at different speeds. So one of them's going slower and the other one's going faster. So slow and fast. I can't do it, but I can't do one slow and the other fast at the same time. If you can do that, please send us a video because I will be very impressed. And that is how Jupiter and Saturn are moving. Jupiter takes 12 years to orbit the sun and Saturn takes 29 years to orbit the sun. So once every 20 years, Jupiter and Saturn they line up in their orbit. This is planetary conjunction. You can actually see the conjunction happening this month just with your naked eye. Jupiter and Saturn are getting closer and closer every day. When you look up at the sky, you can find Jupiter because it's shining brighter than a regular star. Like if you look up at the sky and you look for the extra bright one, you'll find Jupiter. And Saturn also glows very brightly, but it has a golden hue to it. So that's how you can identify Saturn. The main event will happen on Monday, December 21st. On this night, Saturn and Jupiter will be so close that they will appear as one planet. But no matter how close they look to us on Earth, they're still hundreds of millions of miles away from one another. So there's no chance they'll kiss. I know that's what you're all asking. Unless you check out my fan fiction, I call the couple Jupasat. It gets steamy. And this conjunction is extra special as it will be the closest visible conjunction since the year 1226, which probably when it happened in 1226, they were like, ah, those stars are colliding, but they didn't know it was planets. They probably thought the world was ending, no big deal. It's sort of like the stars aligned for these planets to align, like the stars aligned for a bird that landed on my patio this weekend and my cat had just eaten, so she refused to move from this position. 
was a lucky bird, lucky bird. Our next news story takes us to Washington, D.C., to the National Zoo, home of giant panda Mei Shang. Everybody loves a panda who gave birth to a little cub named Xiao Qi Ji on August 21st. This new panda is extra special because Mei Shang just became the oldest captive giant panda to ever give birth at the age of 20. Two, Xiao Qi Ji's name translates to Little Miracle in English, as nobody expected Mei Shang to be able to have another cub. This is her fourth. Look how fluffy it is. That's so little and fluffy. Oh, I love it. That's Xiao Qi Ji. Xiao Qi Ji was about the size of a stick of butter when he was born, but this is normal. That it seems small, but that is normal size for baby panda. And this reporter believes that they should measure all baby animals in terms of sticks of butter. I'm tired of thinking about ants. Newborn pandas are tiny, but not for long, as they grow to be 200 to 300 pounds. Giant pandas live to be 20 years old in the wild and up to 30 years old in captivity. So Mei Shang still has many years ahead of her. Xiao Qi Ji will move to China when he is four years old to live under the care of the Chinese Wildlife Association because guess what? China owns all the giant pandas in the world. And if you want a giant panda in your zoo, it costs $1 million per year to rent one. Ah, for our last fact, it's about everyone's favorite sea animal, manatees. <clears throat> Here it is. Manatees um, pass wind to help with their buoyancy. They hold in their gas to rise to the surface of the water and let it out to sink down to the bottom. Yep, that's it. That's the story. And as for that last story, it's not just the news that's breaking. The story almost didn't make it into the show this week. It was a squeaker. And that wraps up. That may have been my favorite science newsy news ever. Okay, here we go with our first guest. Our first guest is Structures Stress Manager for Boeing, Sydney Hamilton. And in case you missed it, here's a clip from her appearance on Mission Unstoppable. But how do flying things actually fly? One person who knows is aerospace engineer Sydney Hamilton. Sydney started off as a designer for commercial aircrafts, and now she 3D prints parts for satellites planes, and helicopters. She works at the place where they make the flying things, the Boeing Satellite Factory. When I was younger, I used to stand outside oh, and try to fly. Literally. I can look when it comes out. My left foot, next to my right foot, arms out, and once in the ready position, I would try to take off. The great thing about my parents is they never told me that I couldn't fly. So it's only perfect that I'm flying, but just a little differently than I imagined. Big. Yes, Sydney Hamilton, here she is. Okay. Audience, have you ever flown in an airplane? Have you ever used a cell phone? Sydney Hamilton makes things <laughs> these things a reality. Throughout Sydney's career, she has designed 3D printed satellite parts, designed, analyzed, and repaired Boeing's fleet of 767 and 777 airplanes, and managed the team that makes airplanes safe. Yay! And now, Sydney, I know, isn't it weird? Like, you're here and I'm just, like, talking about all of the things you've done while you just I have know. to sit there and listen. <laughs> um, but now she's the manager of a stress analysis team at Boeing, and no big deal, but that's one of the hardest jobs there. Thank you for joining us, Sydney. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Yes, yes. Um, you look fantastic. I love your, sorry, I probably shouldn't do that. Okay. I just love your whole, your eyes and your turquoise. You. Uh, you just look Thank amazing. You. I mean, especially Thank for you. people doing during COVID. I go on a lot of meetings, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of us are just phoning it in, you know, we're just, it's just hard, but anyway, Sometimes it's just so great. bring a little pop of color brightness in people's lives just to be like, you know what? I might get dressed tomorrow, but tomorrow I might yeah. have one pajamas. It just depends on my mood. 
<laughs> I know that is so true and so funny. Um, okay, so now you're managing the stress analysis team at Boeing, and yeah. it's my understanding that basically uh, designers will come to you with a plan for an aircraft and your team and say, "Hey, will this work?" Type yes. of thing. Absolutely. Right. So we're looking at airplanes that are currently flying, new builds that have never been done before, mm -hmm. um, the folding wingtip on an airplane. How does this work? So someone says, I need this to be lighter and I redesigned it. Okay. Well, from one of the words we learned in Mission Unstoppable, we talked about mm -hmm. forces. How much right. force is on this part? Can you actually mm -hmm. change it to look that way? I mean, it might mm -hmm. look super cool, but does it work? And so right. they're sending things to my team to say, okay, yes, this works or make this change. Actually, if you can make this curve a little bit more, it'll fit right. better with these things. Because mm -hmm. what happens is myself being a designer, I've been in this situation where you're mm -hmm. looking at this one part, you are Vincent van Gogh and you are making the most beautiful thing in the whole world. But what about the rest of the airplane? How does this fit right. into that? And the stress right. team is number crunching, looking at the uh, equations and calculations that need to be made to make sure that it actually works. So they're basically like, Sydney, we need help. Uh, we made these beautiful things, right. but we want to make sure they work. And then my right. team and figures it out and make sure it's safe. Dude, that's so cool. Well, of course, and you need to be able to do that before you start building everything because I'm sure it costs billions of dollars to build this stuff. So it's oh, yeah. not like you want to just try it and then fly it and see if it stresses under the forces, you know? So that's really, really We're cool. Hundreds of millions of dollars per plane. It is right, right. Plane cheap. <laughs> yes. That's awesome though. That's so cool. That's so cool. How many people are on your team? 17. Wow. So it's a, it's a, it's a large team. team. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Congratulations. And you would think I would at least get discounts on Boeing planes. Yeah. But you know, expensive <laughs> on sale is still expensive. So Instead of a billion dollars, you get it for a half billion dollars. You're like, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. No more discount than that? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fine, fine. Um, so you've been working for Boeing for quite a while, and you've been a design engineer and a repair engineer for aircrafts, and you worked on a really exciting airplane, the 777 X. Uh, here it is. That looks real. Oh, there you are in front of it. Oh my gosh, that looks so cool. What is new on the 777X that hasn't been done before on other planes? That's a beautiful plane, like by the way. To the well side. That, Sorry, like, say it again. I said, you know, that pose I got going on? Yeah. <gasps> yeah. So the cool thing is, this is the first commercial aircraft that has folding wings. So that means when you're on the runway, you'll see them up like this. And right before you take off, it'll lock into place. That's okay. important because the wingspan really makes an aircraft efficient. And so mm. you're looking at the longer the wingspan, which is from tip mm -hmm. to tip, mm -hmm. the more efficient you are. So the less fuel you'll have to use and the longer you can fly. And right. the fun part about it is the only reason we made them fold is because airplane hangers all are standard size and the wings were so big, right. they couldn't fit. So we're like, right. let's make them fold. So That's that was so one of cool. the cool. Yeah, it was really cool because I actually got to work on that plane on some of the analysis for how all everything stacked up. So to see it in person, in real life, was just like, because ah, they people did it. are putting this together. But it's amazing yeah. because like, human hands are building this yeah. and putting it together. Like, what? Yeah. And I'm yeah. the only one excited every time I walk in the family or into the factory. <laughs> I'm like, hey guys, isn't this amazing? And they're like, I'm, I'm the same way. Me. No, I know. And I've been doing this forever and I'm the same way. And I'm and I'm like, you guys, it's all happening. We're all doing it. And somebody wrote me an email the other day. They were like, 
I am. I have watched this segment with Anna Wenger like enthusiasm, and I was like, "Oh, well, that means you're really enthusiastic and excited about it, then, you know." But that's that's just so cool. I would feel the that's same way if I were you. They're embodying your enthusiasm. Yes, I love that. <laughs> I hope so, because yeah, I hope they like the segment. Um, so okay, so so from airplanes started with airplanes, and you were like, I must go higher, and you moved from air to space, working on satellites. And what mm -hmm. were you doing for satellites? So it's been really cool because I feel like I'm embracing the entire meaning of being an aerospace engineer, from going yeah. from aircraft to spacecraft. Right. Huge change. The materials that you use totally different. The way that you think about things, completely different. Things mm -hmm. I worried about for airplanes, they were like, why are you concerned? And I was like, how is it going to fly otherwise? And they're like, because we use this. Cool, cool. So right, when right, I first right. Yeah. Over, <laughs> just trying to keep up. So when I yeah. first jumped over to the to the dark side, if you will, yeah. uh, working <laughs> on aircraft or air, spacecrafts, Mm -hmm. I was on the advanced design team where I got to actually do 3D printing of parts and got to figure out which side. This is actually yeah. a 3D printed part. And this is the one you might have seen on the episode very briefly. It's cool because it's actually made of metal. And we use this as a bracket. This used to be 100 or so parts. And thanks to 3D printing, now it's just one. So that's incredible. You're out a lot of, yeah, you're taking out a I, lot of weight. Uh huh. And you're taking out like you're looking at efficiency. So this is, I mean, this is like nothing, right? That's incredible but, how light that is. Like honestly, Sydney, I've seen that bracket several times in person, <laughs> and I had no idea it was metal until right now because I thought you could only print. 3D print plastic. Right. So that's the catch. People are like, it must be yeah. made out of plastic. And we do have plastic stuff. But mm -hmm. honestly, this was the first time I had really seen metal. So we can do titanium, we can do aluminum, right. and it has to be aerospace grade. So we are wow. working with suppliers and people to say like, hey, how intricate can you print? Because it gets really challenging because we need very unique things. Every satellite's different. Whether the satellite yeah. is to keep us virtually connected on this call or to right. be your GPS to get you to uh, wherever your um, order is. Going. Whether that's yeah. to you know, yeah. keep your online game among us going. You know, it's, it's so Speaking many Speaking of ways. games, we did have somebody just write in a question about games and they said, do you ever play Kerbal Space Center? Do you know that game? Funny enough, the only time I ever had any exposure to it was when I took a class, I kid you not, called Rocket Science 101 <laughs> in my senior year in college because I needed the extra credits. And right. they made us create this entire mission and you got extra credit if your mission was successful. That's crazy, but, playing Kerbal Space Center. That was my well, extra that's credit great. project. So our, our audience <laughs> needs to know this, that see in rocket, real rocket scientists in Rocket Science 101 have played Kerbal Space Center. So <laughs> it is a legitimate video game. <laughs> you heard it here on Science and Stuff. Also, you heard on science and stuff that you can 3D print in metal because I swear, I don't think that's information that people know. Drop some. <gasps> so, <yeah. laughs> exactly. Um, so, yeah. So, speaking of satellites, because you were talking about, you know, the satellite that tells you where to go on your GPS to deliver your order or a map or that transfers your phone call, there are so many satellites up in in orbit. What happens to them after you send them up into orbit? That is a great question. Um, so that's actually an emerging career in the aerospace industry. I'd probably say that's one of the ones I haven't quite ventured out to yet, but mm -hmm. I find it absolutely fascinating. So what do we do with what we call space junk? It's, yeah, we have individuals just shooting things into space. You have large companies, small companies, 
all having different missions, but as soon as you send it up to space, all that technology is obsolete. It is old because right. we're coming up with things every single day. So right. when it's been up there for five years and it's completed its mission, it just stays in orbit and people are tracking yeah. it, which is a lot of yeah. work because you want to make sure they're not colliding with anything. Yeah. Um, a new one's going up. What do we do with these yeah. pieces? Actually, yeah. interestingly enough, Boeing came up with this cloud. It is like a very dense cloud and mm -hmm. it's supposed to slow the satellites down so much that they deorbit and we would be able to collect them just to help. Oh, and got it. Right. So yeah. Help. So are we polluting space? I would say we have to be very mindful of how much we mm -hmm. are putting into space, um, seeing how if there are things in the way, if we need to clear them and how is it going to affect us in the future? So I do think that it is right. important that we're, we're not just willy nilly throwing everything up there right. because we can, because we do want to learn about the impacts and we do want to make sure that we're being clean and sustainable and right. that we can still see the beautiful sun, you know? <laughs> and so it's yeah. interesting because you're having there's been like lasers that are supposed to shoot them down. They want, they're considering putting sails on satellites to steer them back so that we can collect them. So it is something that I think the world is becoming more aware of. So I'm really excited to see that Boeing is doing it. NASA has been working on it. And there's even this thing that's like, they said the size of a like loaf of bread that's up there. That's like, yeah sweeping through slowly connect collecting satellites so yeah. we've been working on it, and so it's gonna yeah. keep growing yeah i um one of our audience just asked did you have any role models that you looked up to when you oh there's so many questions for you this is just i mean people really want to know about sydney hamilton we had a question that said uh, did you have any role models growing up so definitely my mother um She's just always had such a kind heart. She told me when I was little, Sydney, you may not be able to change the entire world, but you can change the world of one. And then that person can change the world of someone else. And that person could change the world of someone else. And in turn, you're changing the world just by helping one. So I really appreciated her. Um, Wilma Rudolph, which most people don't know. She's from Nashville, Tennessee, just like me. That's why I was born. <laughs> And she was a <laughs> runner. She actually had polio and lost the ability to walk. Mm. And through a lot of work, the doctors were like, you won't, you'll never be able to walk again. She mm. ended up being the first American woman to win three gold medals at the Olympics. So it's just like a I very encouraging, powerful story. I yeah, have I to say, saying, I just got the chills listening about Wilma Rudolph. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, and also your mom. That is such a great uh, idea that you might be able to change. But, but I would say you're changing a lot of lives, Sydney. I would like to think so. But my goal is yeah. always just one. Just if one yeah, person that's good. feels empowered, that's enough. Connected, mm -hmm. I've, I have done something. So it's really exciting to see so many young women and just people being inspired to be interested in STEM because I love it. It's a passion. I want everybody to know you can do it. And if someone says yeah. you can't, let the naysayers go because there's enough people mm -hmm. in the world who will want to tell you no or that you can't do it. And you don't need to be oh, one of yeah. them. It's, no. it's your destiny. Yeah. You choose. I love it. Oh, Sydney <laughs> Hamilton, you're the best. <gasps> Seriously. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> so now that we have covered the science, now it's time for the stuff. Uh, here at uh -oh. Science and Stuff, we, <laughs> here at Science and Stuff, we really like to get to know our guests. And you know, because you're not just a genius who does brilliant work, you are also a person who likes stuff. So uh, we've cut. So we're gonna play Would You Rather with you. We've come up with a list of situations we want to tell. We want you to tell us what you would rather. Are you ready? I this think so. Test. This is a 
fun. It's fun. There's no test here. Um, okay, would you rather fly on a Saturn rocket from the Apollo mm -hmm. program or fly on the space shuttle? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would say the Apollo program, just because it is so classic. I know it's so yeah. classic. Um, it's groundbreaking for so many reasons in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, there's one down the street in the Columbia Memorial Center that was just around. And it's just so cool yeah. to think about um, the engineering that went behind that. And we're doing similar work at Boeing with something called the crew capsule. And a lot yeah. of a lot of astronauts have been significantly impacted by the Apollo program. Mm. So, um, awesome. yeah, I'm going to go Apollo. You heard, it here. you heard it here. She's going Apollo. All right. Next question. This this is going to be hard for you because I understand you've just be recently become a scuba diver. Um, I have. <laughs> Yes. So would you rather travel to space or travel to the bottom of the Mariana Trench? That's tough. Ouch. That's a mean one. Why would you do this to me? Ugh. I didn't do it. The producers <laughs> did. <laughs> See, I'm coming. I would say due to the excitement of being a scuba diver, we're going to nah. the trenches. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Honestly, that's how astronauts train is underwater. And so in a right? way, you're still getting the space experience. So like when they're doing missions, yeah. they actually are underwater because that is the closest thing we have to simulate what it's like to be in space. Yeah. Yeah. And no human has been to the bottom of the Mariana Trench yet. Right? Nope. So it truly is unexplored by humans. That would be awesome. Would okay. Be next so question. Awesome. Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, would you rather be friends with Tia Landry or Tamara Campbell from Sister Sister? You're a big Sister Ooh. Sister fan, right? I am. I am. Oh, they're both such wonderful people. We're going to go with <laughs> Tia for the <laughs> <laughs> I think, How come? I think that they will both be fun. They're so dynamic because one's such a bookworm and then... The other is more of the partier, and I feel like I probably need to go a little bit more. But there you go. Tia and I will be great friends. <laughs> yes. Well, there you go. There you go. Uh, you know, thankfully in this world, you don't have to choose. You can have yeah. both sisters. You know? That, you know? Can I be the, the triplet, maybe? You know? Since exactly. Like, <laughs> yes. Yes. Add her on. Um, okay. Next question. Would you rather be the winner of Master Chef or the winner of America's Next Top Model? My whole heart. My whole heart. Um, I love cooking. You love I those two shows. I adore cooking. That yeah. being said, America's Next Top Model, they travel to some really cool places. Yeah. Yeah. I totally gained so much respect for how hard it is to remain composed in some of those yeah. challenges. So we're going to go yeah. America's Next Top Model for the win. Yes, I love it. No, I watch that too. And you just never think about what they're doing until you watch that show. And you're like, gosh, this right. is actually difficult to do. Um, next, <laughs> next question. Would you rather have dinner with Natasha Romanoff, a.k.a. Black Widow, Wanda Maximoff, a.k.a. Scarlet Witch, or Gamora, a.k.a. Gamora, no secret identity, <laughs> from the Marvel Universe? Oh, I am such a Marvel fan. Um, yeah. I think, so Gamora is a little um, intense. So She I'm totally go is. She's really intense. I feel like she might take the dinner knife and come for my life. So <laughs> I would go with Natasha. I think that she would be the most interesting and fun to have to learn about her life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That first scene with Natasha Romanoff. I can't remember what movie it's in because I've watched all of them and I don't remember the name of the one that she's in. But that opening scene with her is one of the best scenes of all of the movies, she's I think. So cool. like, yeah. She's awesome. Yeah, seriously. She's my friend, so I would appreciate that. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Um, next one, would you rather go clothes shopping with the plastics or bath and body shopping with Damien and Janice from Mean Girls? Ooh. If the plastics are buying, then we go with the plastics. Otherwise, 
Best and body work for the win. Can we say self care for the weekend? Self care for the weekend. Yes, and it's so funny because I because <laughs> I thought the same thing. It's like I'd rather have the plastics pick out my clothes and pay for them, but if I just need to hang out and talk to people, I'm going with Damien and Janice. You know. For sure. Absolutely. And if you get a bath bomb at a discount. Yes. Saturday night. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much for uh, playing Would You Rather and letting our audience get to know you and all of the amazing things that you do. Tell us where we can follow you on social media. Awesome. Well, first, thank you so much for having me. I love yes. being with you guys. Follow me at Sore. Um, on both IG and Twitter. Uh, if you have more questions, you want to learn about space junk, airplanes, pretty much yeah. anything aerospace, let me yeah. know. Or if there's something you want to see, I'd love to do. Um, I love to like just connect with everyone. Sydney Hamilton is there for you, world. Thank you so <laughs> much, Sydney. We'll see you soon. We got to have Yay. you back. We'll have you back for sure. Bye. Bye. Love y'all. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Okie dokie. Next up, we have aquarium biologist Amanda Hodo. In case you missed her segment on Mission Unstoppable, here's a clip of her showing us her awesome job at Moat Marine Laboratory. The auditory cue first, and then you're going to put her target in the water. So you're going to flip it and put it down a couple of feet. Yep, just like that. And then when she comes to the target, I'll use the tongs and give her a nice big tasty piece of fish. and these organisms need to be cleaned up after. Amanda asked me to help, but I know that there are sharks in these tanks, so I offered to help clean in a different way. Oh, she said, oh, what is it? Oh, no. Oh. It's been an amazing day, but I better let Amanda get back to work. Which Amanda is an aquarium biologist at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida, where she gets up close and personal with marine life, including fish, sharks, shrimps, crabs, and more. She's joining us live from Moat today. Hi, Amanda. How's it going? Hi, Anna. Good. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. It's cold here. You said it was cold in Florida. I'm in California. Of course, we're complaining, and really, it's like... <laughs> yeah. It's a relative scale. Chilling in Florida is like, you might need a light jacket. So, Exactly, exactly. Well, I'm so excited to be talking to you today. And I feel like I know you because I watch your segment so many times, like in the process of cutting it and putting it together and getting it on um, Mission Unstoppable. And it's, it's just so exciting that you're able to join us today. And we were just going to jump right in and ask you, so you're an aquarium marine biologist specifically. I'm an aquarium biologist. Yeah, aquarium so um so there's a difference between mm -hmm. aquarium biologist and marine biologist. A slight difference. Um aquarium biologist is basically just more specific. So an aquarium biologist is a type of marine biologist. It kind of falls under the umbrella of marine biology. Right. Right. Awesome. And um, you have tons of jobs at the aquarium, like you do a million different things. Um, but one of them is shark feeding and training, correct? Yeah. So, um, so I'm responsible for the short and long-term care of several exhibits, as well as caring for the aquarium's baby inverts and uh, fish. But I also get to help with our shark training sessions three times a week. So um, that is really, really fun. That's so cool. I mean, how many people would love to train shark? I mean, people are obsessed with sharks anyway. I am one of them. But like the fact that you get to train them as a as your job is just amazing. So what does that entail? Like, how do you train them? And uh, tell us about that. Mm -hmm. So the way that we train our sharks is um, with positive reinforcement. So they like myself are very, very food motivated. So right. um, we, we basically reinforce them to come to a specific target to receive food. So um, the reason why we do that is because one, we can better closely monitor how much they're consuming because that 
exhibit that mm. they live in, which is our 135,000 gallon shark exhibit, has thousands of other fish in it. So it's really important that they get what they need nutritionally and how much food they need. Um, and right. there's a lot of competition in that exhibit. So if we didn't have them coming to specific targets, they would probably get outcompeted by some of the other species in that exhibit. So this way we're able to make sure that they're getting what they need and track um, how many pieces of food they're eating, what they're eating, um, whether they're getting their vitamins or not. And right. um, it also allows us to build on their training in the future. So how do you train them? Well, I have so many questions. Sorry, I, I have one other <laughs> question that I want to ask before we get to the how do you train them is what other species are in there that w are competing for food with them? Because you would think of a shark being like the king of the ocean. You know what I mean? Like that nobody yeah, else would be able to take food away from the shark. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they are they are really, really incredible um, animals. And there, are, but there's tons of other fish in there, um, like creval jacks. Um, and this this exhibit in particular is filled with kind of a ride. So um, we have species such as creval jacks, snook, uh, tarpon, and these are all very fast fish. Um, they're game fish. So um, while the sharks would get some of the food, they probably would get beaten by the creval jacks and the tarpons to the food. Um, so the way, the reason why we have them, why we have the sharks come to the targets is so that we can make sure that they're getting all of the food that we've prepared for them. And as I mentioned before, that they're getting their vitamins. Yes, they need their vitamins, just like all of us. Um, so, so tell us about how you train them. Sure. So, um, so kind of the first step for training is um, with sharks is when they do the desired natural behavior, you give them a reward. So, um, when you're first starting out, every time a shark swims near the target, you would potentially give them a piece of food. And then over time, you let your criteria get more specific. So instead of it being like coming near the target, you know, within a couple of feet, then you're waiting, you're going to wait to give them that piece of food until they come directly in front of it. And they will learn that association. They're very smart. They have uh, the intelligence similar to like small rodent, like a mouse or a rat. Um, so they're very, very smart and they pick up on that. And then as, you know, they keep performing the correct behavior, you keep rewarding them. And um, they definitely learn that association. And then you can build on other uh, natural behaviors after that. So, for example, at Moat, um, we have them trained to swim by their targets. Well, with our nurse sharks, we took it one step further and had... Uh, moving targets instead of stationary targets. And then we would move it around the exhibit and they would learn that wherever the target was, if they came to the target, they would get rewarded. And then the step after that was that we actually stretcher trained our nurse sharks. So that was a really, really amazing thing because then that allows our uh, veterinary staff to do physical exams on them as well as get weights and things like that. So Wow. So, sorry, did you say stretcher trained? Stretcher yeah. trained? Yeah, well, stretcher trained. So you can actually train them to swim into a stretcher. And, um, that is yeah. incredible. That's so cool. I had no idea. You know, everybody kind of like thinks that you kind of just think of sharks as, you know, they're they're portrayed as just kind of like mindless machines, you know, and I think that's so cool that they have the intelligence level of a rodent. How, who, who came up with training sharks? Like who thought of this? <laughs> that's not well, on our list of questions, but it's such a an <laughs> interesting thing. Like, you know. Yeah, they've been, uh, researchers have been training sharks for a very long time, a very long time. Oh, and actually, um, Eugenie Clark did some really, really influential, amazing research with sharks um, that involved also training them. And um, Eugenie Clark has a very, very important and special legacy at Moat. Oh, that's awesome. That's so cool. Um, and now did you, 
I, I just think that's so cool. So what kind of veterinary exams do you do? How often do you have them um, examined or how often do they do the stretcher examination? I don't know what to mm -hmm. call it. <laughs> Um, we did our first uh, stretcher veterinary exam last year. That's so cool. That's so cool. Um, and you also, I wanted to ask you about, we heard that you had an interesting experience in one of the shark exhibits a few years ago, because I know you also dive into the tanks for cleanings yeah. and different activities. Mm -hmm. So, um, Moat actually does a really special event for Halloween called the Night of Fish, Fun, and Fright. And it's where we invite guests to come to the aquarium in um, costumes and trick-or-treat. So we have, we have lots of families that really enjoy coming to the aquarium, looking at all of the spooky decorations that the biologists have um, planted in our exhibits. And um, so cool. one of the main parts of the Night of Fish, Fun, and Fright is that we actually do underwater pumpkin carving. And uh, this is something really unique that the aquarium offers. And I'll offer to be one of the divers, one of the carvers. And I remember I hadn't dove this exhibit yet. Um, typically I'm in the diving in the main shark exhibit, but I hadn't gotten a chance to dive bonnet head yet. So I was really excited. And um, very, very focused on the carving portion of it because I would say I'm not the most artistically inclined person. All of that artistic you're talent. You're doing works. a lot of things at once. You're scuba diving, you're in a shark tank, you're carving a pumpkin. Yeah. It's, it, you got to focus. You got to focus on it. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot going on, but I would say I was like very focused on carving something that didn't look like a blob. Um, and that actually looked like an, an ocean animal and that guests would enjoy. So I was very focused on that. Um, and, you know, we're going through safety protocols and I'm obviously focused on that as well and making sure that I'm safe. And I get into the exhibit with my pumpkin and I start carving and I'm really focused on doing straight lines and everything. And then I just feel something like bump me. And I kind of like, take a step back, I kind of had to like refocus because I was very focused on carving right. this one particular line. And, and so I start looking around and I'm like, what, what bumped me? And I realized that it was one of the bonnet head sharks. And it just like completely just like bumped me on the shoulder. And I, I kind of had to take a step back and, and, you know, be like, okay, I, I should probably keep an eye out for that. And sure enough, with another <laughs> I had another one like boot me on the head and it turns out that they're like, their eyesight is not the, not the best. Um, so they're kind of clumsy in that way. And when I talked to other uh, divers who were really familiar with diving in that exhibit, they were like, oh yeah, that happens all the time. They're like, they're kind of, they're very clumsy. They like bump into us all the time. And I just thought That's it was hilarious. hilarious. I was so worried about the carving and stuff. And right. here I am. Just like in their space, just like yeah, totally like yeah, that. Bonnet so head, bonnet head sharks, yeah, that's yeah. so funny. Yeah. They're just like, you're not usually here, and we're just swimming around. That's so funny. They have bad eyesight. Oh my god, that's so cute. I, at first, I was like, oh, is it? You know, are they territorial, or maybe mm -hmm. they don't like pumpkins? No, I was just, I was just in their way, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, you were just there. Yeah. You're like, no, I was just there, and that's how they roll. Oh, my gosh, yeah, and that's sharks, so funny. Sharks have, have decent eyesight, but they, they rely on a lot of other senses as well. They have amazing senses of smell, um, and, you know, they, use, they also uh, use magnetic fields and rely on electricity to find their prey as well. Um, but with bottom heads... Hold on, we gotta get back to the magnetic fields and the electricity. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit? We just skated right by there. They use uh, magnetic fields and electricity to find their prey. So elasmobranchs, um, they have, they have just over time they've developed um, the ability to sense magnetic fields and to use. Um, they have electroreceptors, and so they use those to kind of figure out the movements of prey and the, the 
their surroundings as well. So um, they can sense when there's like a, a solid rock or something like that to avoid it as well as um, sense when there's prey nearby. Wow, that's so interesting. Right, yeah, so I guess cool. like extra cool. <laughs> they are, they're so cool. Um, I could do a show just on sharks. Like I was planning so many shark segments for this season of Mission Unstoppable that um, Lisa, who's a producer with me on the show, I was like, and then we'll do this about sharks and that about sharks. And she's like, do we have too many shark segments? And I was just like, no, we can't have too many shark segments. Never. I could have one in every episode. I just think they're so fascinating. Well, that is so, so cool, Amanda. You just seriously have the coolest job ever. How often do you get in the tanks every, every like, do you go in every week or is it, how often do you clean them and, and I mean, get in there? I mean, typically once every other week. So we have um, quite a few divers in our department and we kind of rotate through, through the positions. Um, but I am a regular diver in the shark exhibit and I'm usually in the water every other week. That's so cool. When did you get um, certified for scuba diving? Certified intern at Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. So when I was an intern and I believe I, I had just graduated college, um, I found a local dive shop because I, it was something that I had been wanting to do for years, um, but didn't quite have the funds. And I was in areas where it wasn't necessarily, uh, the ocean wasn't accessible or yeah. easily accessible. So, so when I came, city, right? what was that? You grew up in the city. I did. Yeah. I grew up in Chicago and they do have, um, they do have dive shops typically in the suburbs um, mm -hmm. and they would dive in the lake. Um, but I just, I had, you know, there were a lot of other circumstances that didn't really allow me to get it done when I was younger. So when I came here as an intern, um, it, I felt like the stars kind of aligned. Um, the local dive shop was doing a serious discount for, um, people that worked at Moat and, um, it just kind of worked out perfectly. And I got certified. I got my open water certification done when I was an intern. And then after, shortly after that, I went ahead and got my advanced uh, certification. And then while I was at Moat, I actually completed my rescue diver certification. That's awesome. So now you're an expert. Do you go no, around the world? Yeah. <laughs> um, do you go, have you been to like the Great Barrier Reef? Do you travel places? Do you love diving? Is, is that something that you do in, in your spare time? I really enjoy diving, um, and I have traveled a little bit um, on my own, um, and I have been to the Great Barrier Reef. It was incredible, incredible, one of the most amazing dives I've ever done in my life, um, and I really do enjoy diving recreationally. Um, I love doing work as well, um, but typically when I'm diving recreationally, I'm diving by myself because my family members are not certified. Um, really sure. none of my loved ones are, and that's typically who I'm, who I'm traveling with. So I dive every once in a while on my own. Um, but you know, I, if I, if any of them were certified, I would probably go more and go with them, but, um, it's not totally. necessarily something I can do with my family. So. No, totally. I know. I know. It's, um, it is something that is like, Certain people just love to do it, and the other people are like, "No thanks." There's white tip sharks. Yeah. I went to the Great Barrier Reef, and and they were like, "Oh, those are white tip sharks," you know, and and they're just swimming around sharks, you know, while everybody's you know floating around in the water. It was pretty, mm -hmm. it was pretty, pretty awesome. I really really enjoyed it. So um, so you train the sharks, and how mm -hmm. do you, how many sharks are that? How many sharks do you train? So there are seven sharks in the shark exhibit. Um, and they all pretty much, we do a training session at the same time. So we'll put targets in different areas of the exhibit and do them all at the same time. So the sharks that I typically work with are either uh, the sandbar sharks, which is it. Um, I will train one of our two nurse sharks and we'll train them in the back pool, in the shallow pool. That's awesome. And how do you, so the two nurse sharks, how, do they have names? How can you tell the difference between the two of them? Um, just physical characteristics. So one of them is 
a female and one of them is a male and the female has more orange and yellow coloring i would say um and then the male is covered in these like gray blue speckles so um it's really really neat because while one of them looks very like brown and orange and has typical nurse shark coloring the other one has this beautiful blue like iridescence going on on skin so um that's how we tell the two versions apart mm -hmm. i didn't know that sharks had that kind of differentiation in like oh, yeah. coloring uh, I yeah mean, you know and, you uh, yeah. even in fish too there's a lot there can be a lot of variation in color and stripe patterns and stuff like that of the same species awesome. That's so cool. I had no idea. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. This is, you've now been on Mission Unstoppable. You've been on our Twitch show twice and I just love you. And I want to know everything about the sharks going forward. So keep us posted. I'm sure we'll check in with you again in a couple of months. Tell everybody where they can follow you on social media. Yeah. So I have an Instagram account, so you can follow me on at aquarium.biologist and I'll be posting all about my aquarium adventures. Oh, that's so cool. And everybody stick around because Amanda made us an awesome video where she shows us around the Moat Aquarium, specifically the Aquarium Conservation Lab and the Grass Flat exhibit. So check out the video. We're going to play it right now. Thank you so much, Amanda. See you next time. Bye. 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 Aquarium Conservation Lab, which is the aquarium's multi-species aquaculture lab. And in it, we breed and raise uh, fish and invertebrate babies. So right now we're breeding a variety of things. We have stone crab larvae in here. We have spider crab juveniles, peppermint shrimp. And we also have neon gobies, which is one of the first uh, animals that I learned how to breed. So we are breeding these neon gobies, which are a cleaner fish and they eat dead skin cells and uh, extra bits of food off of other fish. So they're really, really important for healthy coral reefs and we are breeding them here. And I actually designed and built the system specifically for breeding neon gobies. So um, we've had a lot of success and I'll show you some of the babies that we've bred. So to breed neon gobies, one of the first things that you have to do is you have to make a pair. So what I do in here is a little bit of trial and error and a little bit of uh, genetics work as well. Um, I'll take a male goby and a female goby and put them in a breeder box together and see how they interact. And if it's love, then um, shortly after they'll produce some eggs and they're actually semi-secretive egg layers. So they'll lay their eggs inside of a place that is partially hidden. And in this case, we give them a piece of PVC tube and they'll actually lay those eggs in the tube and then the male will come and he'll fertilize those eggs. And after about three days, you'll see the eggs get eyes and start to really develop those eyes. And then after laying, after about eight to 11 days, the eggs will hatch. And so the way that the system works is that once I think that they're near hatching, I'll actually take the whole breeder box, move it over here and hang it on one of these larval tubs and the air, the air will cause some water movement and the larvae will swim out into this larval tub and the parents will stay in the breeder box. So once the larvae have all hatched, I'll move the breeder box back onto the main exhibit and soon after the male and female will lay eggs again. And this way I can raise the larvae separate from the parents because they require a lot smaller food. Um, we actually raise a lot of our live foods in-house, including rotifers and larval brine shrimp. And those are two things that we will feed uh, yet really, really young gobies. So after they develop, they uh, go through metamorphosis after about one month and they'll turn blue and just look like miniature versions of their parents. Um, I'll put them on display, give them a little bit more time to grow up and eat a lot of different kinds of foods. And then once they're of appropriate size, that's when we'll actually move them into other exhibits at Moat to clean our other fish. So one of those exhibits is the shark exhibit, 
that is 135,000 gallons and has three different species of sharks in it. We'll add neon gobies to that exhibit and then Honestly, when I walk by, quite frequently, I'll see them cleaning other fish, such as our Goliath grouper, um, and they'll establish cleaning stations in that exhibit. So you'll see fish come up, they'll kind of solicit a cleaning, which in my head, it's, it's more like they slow down and sometimes they'll like lean in a certain direction. And then you'll see the gobies come out, hop on and start eating dead skin cells. And it's almost like a spa treatment for those fish. So they end up getting a service, a cleaning service, and they're healthier after it. And then the neon goby ends up getting a nice meal. So these are neon gobies that were born in July. Um, so they're just a handful of months old. And what they're doing right now is they're actually eating the dead skin cells off of my hand. So normally about this age, they get very excited when anyone comes over and um, you know, d tries to do some work in this exhibit. Uh, this is a natural behavior that they do, being that they're cleaner fish. And um, it doesn't hurt. A lot of people are worried about it hurting, but it just feels like a very light scraping. So I've got about 100 juvenile neon gobies in this exhibit. And um, as they grow, I'll move them around, give them extra space, and um, adjust their diets as they, as they grow to make sure that they're getting the appropriate nutrition that they need. So this is the grass flat exhibit at Moat. Um, it's about 700 gallons, and it's filled with lots of different local species, fish and invertebrates, that can be found in grass flats right outside in Sarasota Bay. So in here we have pencil urchins, we have sheep's head minnows, a spider crab, hermit crabs, gulf killifish, and the list goes on and on. And some of my favorite species in this exhibit are our cowries, which are basically just big snails. Um, they tend to go nuts for the broccoli and a snail moves kind of slow, so going nuts for a snail is they just, every time I put broccoli in here, they just, head over and they eat most of it. So broccoli is a favorite of theirs. Um, I would say my favorite fish in here is the belted sandfish. And I'll show you that. As well as the spider crab, of course. Um, he's, he's kind of a ferocious feeder. So um, it's really fun to feed this exhibit because there's so much going on and um, there's so much life and it's a great representation of our local habitat. So I feed this exhibit once a day and they get vegetables as well as meaty foods like krill and uh, silver sides, which is a small species of fish, as well as uh, broccoli, lettuce, zucchini. I've done carrots and beets lately and um, those have been a little hit or miss. I think they're more fans of zucchini, broccoli and lettuce. And um, Actually, pretty much everyone in here will pick at the veggies. So surprisingly, I've got about four, four or five fish species in here and they will all pick at the veggies. So in, the, in their natural habitat, they would probably spend time picking at the natural seagrass that's growing. And in this exhibit, we don't have live seagrass, we have artificial seagrass. So in order to replenish those nutrients that they would be getting from live seagrass, we offer them vegetables of a very varying different kinds and all vary up what vegetables I give them. So if one day I give them broccoli, the next day I'll try to give them zucchini or lettuce or switch it up completely and give them some carrots. So they're constantly getting uh, a variety of nutrients that they need and um, also different flavors and textures as well.
You don't follow CBS Unstoppable on YouTube? How will you know when new videos drop? You better go subscribe before you miss a crazy stim moment. Like me walking a shark or making a black hole in my